Hey guys, it's Karen from A Yarn Tale. I'm coming to you from Chicago where I live with my husband, our three kids, and our dog Max. This is a knitting podcast where I talk about what I'm working on, what I want to work on, and what I should be working on but just haven't done it all. So let's get right into it. It's been about two weeks since the last podcast and I have a bunch of finished objects. You might have noticed. I'm wearing one. This is, at long last, the Social Bubble Jumper by Brenda Lamb. I knit it out of Knit Picks Tough Puff, which is 100% wool, chunky yarn, so chunky, in the colorway pomegranate. And I love it. I'll try to stand up. It's kind of awkward, but really the showstopper is the sleeves. So it is knit, uh, bottom up, in the round. It's mostly stuck in it. There is... Um, a pattern of pearl bumps all the way around. And then kind of the big design element is you pick up for these giant bubble stitch sleeves that I knit twice because I messed up my bubble stitch, but finally bit the bullet and just finished it. I haven't woven in the ends yet because I'm not sure what to do with chunky yarn, how to even weave this in. I might have to use a crochet hook or something because it is just giant. I mean, obviously no tapestry needle can deal with this monstrosity. Um, so I just stuffed all the ends in there <laughs> and I've just been wearing it around because it's really cute. It's like, I wouldn't say it's cropped, but it's definitely high hip and it is heavy. So I'm glad I got it done because it's still cold in Chicago, but there are a couple of warm days. Like it's supposed to be almost 60 tomorrow, 60 degrees. So I want to make sure I get some wear out of this before I have to pack it away till next year. So social bubble jumper, I would highly recommend it. It is a really, really quick knit. I It took me forever because I got distracted by other shiny new things. But I, for reference, I had to rip out this sleeve because of the bubble stitch situation and I was able to pick up the stitches and knit it again in two days. And I didn't even really spend that much time on it. I just took it to my girl's ballet, which is like two hours. So I would say you can do a single sleeve in maybe five hours if you're slow like me and the sleeves take way longer than the body so all in like 20 hours or less <laughs> and you too can have an amazingly giant sweater I feel like I have Popeye arms um in this and I and I'm loving it so that's my social bubble jumper done and done my next finished object I actually don't have with me because my daughter wore it to school <laughs> surprise I made a scrappy hat that if you follow me on Instagram, you might have seen. Um, I, I've really been trying to use up some of my leftover yarn because I'm collecting quite a stash of it. So I used, do I have it? I do, oh yes. Okay, all my little scraps for this hat are in this bag that I got in Maine. It's actually made out of recycled sale material. So if you listen, it's like pretty crinkly and, um, cool. So I used three colors in this hat. I'll put a picture up so you can see what it looked like, but this is a skein of lichen and lace that I knit a single sock out of and then lost the sock and never cast on the second. Um, so I had maybe 50 grams of this, uh, and I don't remember the colorway, but it's like this beautiful tonal blue that I love. And then I have uh, this yarn, which is a fingering weight from Madison and State, I believe it's called Lake Breeze. And that's just kind of, I, I thought they went really well together. I've been holding them double for the hat because it provides a little bit more warmth. And then this is leftover Madeline Tosh light plus glitter that I used for my daughter's cardigan. So there's some Stellina sparkle in there. There it is. Um, and it's just a natural colorway. So I was marling them together cast on 90 some stitches and did some ribbing and then just went round and round it actually turned out bigger than I expected like it fits me decently but um my kindergartner likes slouchy hats and it looks pretty good on her so um so she's been wearing it and she wore it to school today which is why we're stuck with the pictures uh I have cast on it's a whip but since it's using all the same yarns might as well show it. I have cast on the beginnings of matching mitts for that hat. So I was just gonna kind of marl them the same way, like put put the blue on the bottom and then 
um, move into the more medium blue and then top it off with the white. I did not, well, here's the problem. I did not weigh my yarn scraps. So there is a decent, if not a guaranteed chance that they will not match or I'll run out of some scrap or another. But who cares? They're like kid mittens. I'm making them kid size because my girls keep trying to take my larger mittens that I made for myself and they're really bummed that they definitely don't fit. My next finished object is my tin can knits, the world's simplest mittens. I made these out of air and weight scraps for myself and I haven't worn in the ends yet, but I have worn them all over town. <laughs> I kind of feel like the ends just make them extra warm and fuzzy on the inside. These are, I showed them last time, but the thumbs weren't done. Well, one of them was done, but it was too short. So I ripped it out and made it a little longer and wrapped it up. Super quick knit. These yarns I talked about in the last episode are leftover scraps from my battle hat that I knit. It is knit out of Jameson's of Shetland, Shetland Heather in duck egg. Miri Dancers is the black and some kind of white. Can't remember what the white's called, but uh, I love this pattern. I love these mittens. I wear them a lot. They're kind of cartoony, but not in a crazy way. I just think it says like fun instead of wackadoo. I mean, I get it with the giant puffy sweater. Maybe it's a little wackadoo. <laughs> I don't know. Finish object number two. I, if you're looking for mittens or just a way to use up scraps, I would highly recommend that Tin Can Knits pattern because it, it's so fast and really, it's a really good fit. So on to whips. Um, I have been knitting my fingers off this week and I managed to get through the yoke of my Schneeflocken. So if you've watched this podcast at all in the last year, you undoubtedly have seen this pullover and you're probably super sick of this pullover, um, but it's almost over you guys. <laughs> so I, last time I was here, there was a progress marker right about, right about here, but I removed it because I actually blocked it uh, after I finished the yoke because it was, <laughs> it was weirdly cinching in. Um, my pullover had a waist. <laughs> and I was worried that it was going to stay like that. So um, rather than continue to freak out, I just wet blocked it and, and kind of stretched it out to the dimensions I wanted. And I, it looks much, much better. So start at the beginning. This is the Schneeflocken Pullover by Sarah Solomon of Into the Wool. I am knitting it out of Brooklyn Tweed Loft in the colorway Fossil, which is the white, and Pumpernickel, which is looking black but it's actually super dark brown and I love it the hem has the color work all the way around and then you knit it from the bottom up you knit the sleeves separately and join them and then um, the color work reappears again on the yoke and on the sleeves and I did when I blocked the sleeves I stretched them out a bit so they're not this was my first bit of color work was knitting the knitting the pattern on this cuff and it did pull in quite a bit because my tension was just really weird. I was out of practice with color work, had never really done anything and so you could tell. <laughs> but I think after I blocked it, it does not look bad. And especially when you're wearing it, I mean, maybe I'll put it on. Should I put it on? Okay, I'm gonna put it on, hang on. Okay, this is the pullover. Um, like I said, I did block it, so I think the fit's really good. I haven't grafted the underarms, so there's a giant hole there, um, but that will come. I think the fit's really good, but I still have to pick up stitches and add a turtleneck in the dark brown. I don't think that'll take that long, right? I mean, it's one by one ribbing, so maybe it'll take 10 years. But um, compared to the pullover, you know, it's not going to be that bad. So here's the color work on the sleeves. And it does pull in the tiniest bit. But I really don't think you'd notice. It does not bother me at all. So I was really pleased about that. Um, this is my first color work yoke sweater. And you can kind of tell. So I think the tension turned out really well. But you can see where I joined 
the body and the sleeves. Like that's just a couple of really awkward rows right here. I don't know if it's coming up on camera, but you can definitely see where that join is. Um, you just kind of knit all the way around and it's really wonky. The needles didn't want to go where I wanted them to go and my cable was weirdly bulging out. Um, so, I mean, is it the most professionally executed yoke sweater? Not really. I think it's beautiful. Um, I know last time I had complained that I, there was a lot of rowing out on the back where I did my short rows and there still is. Like even after blocking, you can see it but it's on my back and I can't see it. <laughs> so um, I'm not gonna let it bother me. I think this is definitely the best I can do. Um, and hopefully I'll just get better at that rowing out situation. I know I watched a bunch of videos and you guys provided so many helpful tips about just pulling your pearls a little bit tighter as you go, like give them a little extra tug. And I've been doing that since. And I do think it's making a difference. I mean, it's not in time for this sweater because I'm certainly not going back and redoing it. But um, going forward, like hopefully that problem will not be an albatross in the rest of my knitting life. <laughs> um, so this is the Schneeflocken. What else do I have to say about it? I would really recommend it. The pattern is incredibly well written. Um, especially for someone who had never done a bottom-up construction before and I'd never done that much of a chart. Uh, it's very easy to follow. It's very, um, if you just sort of trust in the pattern and go along, I, I really didn't hit very many hiccups aside from just general technique. Like I just need more practice at this type of technique. So, you know, success. So I'm going to keep working on this. I'll be plugging away at the turtleneck and hopefully before too long, I'll have a finished sweater just in time to pack it away for spring. Okay, what else? So that's my first big whip. My second whip, okay, you might remember when I was looking around for scraps for my mittens, I mentioned that I found this pair of stripy socks that just needed the end of a cuff and I had to cut in an afterthought heel. And I was like, well, shoot, I'm gonna knock that out. Why don't I just do that? So I finished the, the cuff it looks really weird and flared out because I did a stretchy bind off, but um, I knit them toe up. I did a stretchy bind off, but when you're wearing them, um, it looks fine. So even though they look weird right now, on your foot, um, it's no problem at all. But here is the problem. So I was just about to cut in the heel and I was like, oh, where do I cut it in? And I noticed something really weird. <laughs> so. You might notice one of these socks is way longer than the other. So if you line up the toes, hang on, I'll do it this way so you can see. If you line up the stripes for the toe, right? There they are. My heel should go in right here between the green and the purple. Great. But then you get to the top and like, oh, Oh no, I knit an extra color repeat. What? What was I even doing? I think I was knitting on these in the car on the way back from Maine and I just kind of went on autopilot and ended up with one sock that's way longer than the other. Now, it is the sock that still needs the heel. So I didn't cut it in because I was like, shoot, like what do I do? So I think I'm gonna, first I was like, oh, it doesn't bother me, they're for me. They're for me, right? I'll just scrunch it down, no one will even notice. But the more I look at it, like it kinda does bother me. <laughs> so I think I'm gonna take out the cuff and then just pull back and knit the cuff. It's literally 12 rows of ribbing. I mean, how hard is that? That's not gonna be that hard. And then I just have to cut in the heel. I even marked where the heel was supposed to be. So, you know, I thought this was gonna be a finished object this week, but once I hit that snag, I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to put you in a corner for a while. I can't deal with you. I can't deal with you. So, stripey socks, almost done yet again. Actually, these were supposed to be my April socks for last year. I don't know. Last year, I thought I was gonna knit 12 pairs of socks in the year. <laughs> so I did January, February, March, and then these were April, and I knit no more socks. <laughs> So um, that was kind of a fail, but maybe they'll be done for April this year. 
fingers crossed. So my next work in progress is a new cast on. I talked about it and I, uh, I talked about it when I bought the yarn, but I didn't actually think I was going to cast on until this pullover was done. But once I finished the yoke, it felt like it was mostly done, almost done. And I thought, you know, I really should cast something else on. So Michael over at Peace for Peace Crafting Podcast, which if you don't watch, you definitely should. It's a fantastic YouTube channel. Michael's from Chicago and he is hosting a sweater knit along. It has the hashtag on Instagram, sweater me peace mail. And basically you just have to knit a sweater or crochet a sweater, or I guess if you could weave a sweater, um, that would count too, because it's a mail. So I decided to cast on the spot sweater by Ann Benzel, which I do have the pattern here. And I did print out the front page pattern picture. So I am making my sweater in the same color palette as she did because I just I just love that <laughs> I just love it I want everything about that um so I bought the recommended yarn it is three strands of mohair in the background this is Filco Lanatilia in three shades which I think are just numbers are they okay they are so it's color 101, which is this really creamy white. It is color 196, which I believe is, there were colorway names on my order. I don't remember. Well, anyway, it's the recommended ones in her pattern. So if you're super interested, you can click over and check it out. This is color 336, which I think is latte, I believe. Um, so these three make the background color and then the contrast color is Philcolana Pernia. This is a DK weight wool. It's 100% Peruvian Highland wool, DK weight. And then when you hold the three mohairs together, I'm assuming you get some kind of DK weight. So I decided I was just gonna swatch for the spot sweater. So I actually did two swatches. <laughs> I'll tell you why. So I knit my first swatch, which I believe is this one. I cast on however many stitches for my swatch and then I realized that the first 12 rows of the pattern, so this is an all over color work sweater, but the first 12 rows at the collar are knit flat, color work, stranded color work, knit flat, which I was like, no, 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 I thought this was in the round. It is in the round, except for the very top. There's like some neck shaping that happens at the top. So I was like, how do you even knit stranded color work flat? I don't even know if that's possible. I mean, obviously it's possible. It was in the pattern, but um, Ann Vensel is Danish, I believe. And her pattern is lovely and the sweater is beautiful, but it doesn't go into a huge amount of detail as to how to accomplish <laughs> the very complicated things in the pattern. So I dove down the rabbit hole of color work knit flat on YouTube and it is a deep and wide rabbit hole. And so I knit my swatch. I had to teach myself. I do, I hold the two colors of yarn one in each hand. So I, I usually knit English style throwing where I hold the yarn in my right hand. And so I held the background colors of mohair in my right hand. And then I held the contrast color in my left hand. And it was great because on the one side I was just knitting, but then once you turn it over, I had to purl my way back. So I had to teach myself how to purl continentally, <laughs> which all you continental knitters out there are probably like, whatever, you just do it. Um, but for me, I should have, I mean, there's no way I could have possibly videoed it because I would have needed yet another hand. <laughs> and I was already felt like I was one hand short, but it was hilarious. I was like, it was like my first day of knitting ever. Do you remember the first day you ever knit where you're holding the needles and then you're like, okay, I got to get that yarn through that loop. Like, how do I get it in there? I tried so many different ways to tension my yarn. And I was like, do I move my finger this way? Should I move it that way? I was trying to figure out a way that I could hold the yarn and keep a good tension and still get my needle through the freaking loops. 
to purl my way back. And this was only, I think, 36 stitches for my swatch. It's a pretty loose gauge. So um, I did it. I was like, I just have to be able to do this for 12 rows. I, I mean, to be honest, if I had not already bought the yarn, I likely would have picked a different sweater. Because I did not realize that when I bought the pattern. Except I love this pattern. I love this sweater. But um, I was like, I just have to get through those 12 rows and then I can just do regular color work, which I feel like I'm in a good groove with stranded color work after this pullover. So I was like, all right, I'm just gonna power through. I'm not gonna give up. So I did my first swatch and it came out a little tight. I think I was supposed to have 21 stitches per four inches and I had 24, 23 or 24. So I was like, all right, well, usually I would just pick a different needle size and cast on because I can't remember the last time I did multiple swatches. I don't think I've ever knit multiple swatches for a single project, even though I know you're supposed to. But I just, one is enough, right? One is enough. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to knit a second one because I need a little bit more practice with the pattern and with the color work knit flat aspect of it. So I also was a little bit worried. Like usually if I were doing a pullover in the round, I would knit my swatch in the round. But since part of the sweater is knit flat, I really want to practice knitting it flat. So I just did flat back and forth. So there's a chance that my sweater will turn out a wildly different size than I intend. <laughs> but you know, I'm just gonna go with it. We're going with it. So this is my second swatch, which looks weirdly identical to the first, but I did get gauge with that. I, this was on, the first one was on a size seven, which was the recommended needle. And then it came out small. So I went up, instead of going up to an eight, I went up to a nine because I thought that would be a little bit too far and I for sure wasn't knitting three swatches. I mean, for sure. <laughs> so I was like, I'll just do a nine and then I can figure out whether I should use an eight or a nine. And it turns out the nine was spot on for gauge after I watched it. So I'm glad I did the nine. But size nine needles are really kind of big. I mean, not compared to the social bubble jumper, which was like a US 17. But I mean, for for a pullover that I that's pretty drapey, they're, they're pretty big needles. So um, it knits up really fast. Like I was able to do both of these swatches in a day, which is ridiculous. Cause usually my swatches take forever. I feel like I'm spending the whole day just on one and then I have to wash it and I have to wait. But I sort of knocked these out right away cause the mohair is super fluffy. And I actually, um, I think the fuzz of the mohair, which is just super intense. I mean, check that out. The fuzz of the mohair kind of disguises any tension issues I was having with the stranded color work, and I love it. <laughs> I think that's a great feature. Um, I'm gonna definitely consider mohair for some of my other color work projects in the future because this looks really good. Um, and believe me when I say I had no idea what I was doing. So I cast on, I cast on the pullover, and I'm just gonna show it like this because um, it's just really awkward angle wise. So like I said, the first 12 rows or so is knit flat back and forth. And there is a chart. Um, don't worry, I'm not gonna show the chart, but there is a pretty detailed chart as to how to do your increases. It's like, look something like that. Um, Cause it's a raglan style pullover. So you have increases here and at the back um, along the shoulders and it was really complicated. So the increases are done in pattern, which now that I say it and now that I've been knitting the pattern for a little bit, I understand what that means. But when I first approached the project, I looked at the chart and it was kind of like, here's the stitch pattern. And then when you get to the raglan, just do your increases in pattern and you know, on the knit side, it looks like this. And on the pearl side, it looks like that. And there was really not much explanation as to what that was supposed to look like. And when I tried to match the chart up to my stitch count, it didn't seem to match up. And I was really concerned that I had knit these two swatches and I wasn't going to be able to accomplish the pullover. And 
to make matters worse, it's three strands of mohair. So if I had to rip out, I kept being like, oh my God, if I have to rip back, it's gonna be mohair ripping back. Like, oh my God. Um, and I almost just kind of abandoned the whole thing because it seemed ill-advised. But I thought, well, I'm gonna try. So Ann Vensel has a YouTube channel where um, for each pattern, she just knits through some of the tricky parts with no audio. It's just, she'll put like the pattern instruction up and then um, it's literally just the camera focused on her hands, knitting whatever row she's talking about. So she had done the first four rows, four or five rows of like the cast on and then the beginning of the spot sweater in this manner. And I was like, okay, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna knit along with her so like she <laughs> I don't I basically put my kids in front of a movie and was like okay I'm doing this so she cast on and I cast on and like she knit across the first row and I literally I didn't even look at the chart I just like knit with her and then I was like okay I'm doing it like it's happening it doesn't look that bad I think I'm I think I've got the pattern right and then I noticed that um there were no more videos for that pattern and I was like wait what about um like rows 5 through 12 because once I got joined in the round I was pretty confident I could follow the chart and the increases because at that point I would have done I don't know six or seven of them so like you know I figured I would catch on but after four rows like I was not quite there <laughs> so I'm like oh no okay well so her videos ran out and I was like, oh no, okay, now I'm really into it and I don't really know what to do. So I looked on YouTube because I'm like, surely someone else has this problem. Um, I mean, I don't know how people possibly solve problems and learn new things before YouTube because that's really my go-to for almost everything. Like one time I had to relight the pilot light on my furnace. Talk about nerves of steel. I was like, I might blow my family up, but it's really cold in here, so I'm gonna do it. Um, thanks YouTube because my house is warm and my family is safe. Uh, but so I looked on YouTube and there was, I, I think they're pronounced Onling. It's that yarn company, uh, they have their own line of yarn and they sell a kit for the spot sweater. And they had some sort of how-to videos in the style of Ann Bensel that went a little bit further. So I was like, okay, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna do it. And I work through those videos and then I kind of felt like I had the hang of it and I just sort of carried on my merry way and I have just joined in the round. I'm not sure what's going on here. So you had to cast on all these extra stitches and then join in the round. So I did that but it makes the front of my collar kind of a weird v-neck which at a certain point you pick up and knit some ribbing and fold it over, I think. So maybe that will work itself out. I'm not really sure. Like I keep looking at the picture. I guess it does go down a little bit in the front. But in my pattern, it looks, in my project, it looks pretty pronounced. But I did what they said to do. So I'm just, I'm just gonna trust the pattern and hope that it all works out in the end. So this is my spot sweater. Um, I'm really pleased with how it's working up. I have not actually been focusing on my tension because I've just been trying to focus on what the heck is going on with the pattern. Like this is definitely the most complicated thing I've ever attempted to make. I am hoping that it gets easier once I get the hang of it. Um, it's definitely easier than it was a couple of rows ago. So that might be true. Also mine looks a lot yellower than the pattern page. I mean, I bought the colors that she bought and like that looks pretty off-white and mine looks pretty yellow. Like super yellow actually. But you know what? I still like it. It has kind of a 70s vibe, like a 70s ski lodge vibe. Um, if I were into that kind of thing. I'm much less into the skiing and much more into the like après ski <laughs> where you can sit in the lodge with your knitting and like a coffee and hang out um so I think this would go quite well with that vibe <laughs> I am hoping to knit this for Michael's make-along 
for Peace for Peace Crafting, but the make along ends at the end of April and that's a lot of knitting for me. Like I, I've never knit a sweater in two months except for my social bubble jumper, which was chunky yarn, which doesn't really count. So I'm hopeful that I can make good progress on this. It is size nine needles, so it's going pretty quickly. I mean, this is probably two days worth of work. One day where I was basically crawling along trying to convince myself that I could knit continentally <laughs> and do yarn management with three balls of mohair and another contrast color going back and forth. It was, I'm glad it's over. I'm glad it's over. Um, and I'll let you know how it goes. Cross your fingers. What else do I have? I think that might be all my whips. Hang on. Jimmy Flapkin. I did, um... I have thought about the wood black tea <laughs> from I, a couple episodes ago. I said I cast on the wood black tea by Emily Green, which is a Brooklyn tweed pattern, which I love. Um, but I just haven't. Wait, is it a Brooklyn tweed pattern? Maybe it's not. I lie. I lie. But I um, haven't touched the wood black. I was going to, but then I got sucked into the shiny flock and I just figured I'd finish the yoke. So hopefully next week I'll make some progress on the wood block because I do love that and then I need to cast on or think about what I'm going to cast on for the knit along that's happening on this channel so if you saw my last video then you know all about what's going on with the knit along but if you didn't get a chance to watch it I'll pop up a link if you want to go back and see but I can give you a quick overview here so we are doing a tin can knits knit along that's going to start March 20th which is a Sunday and run through June 15th. So plenty of time for all of the sweater knitters out there to pick something out and cast it on and um, hopefully finish it up by the end. Whips are allowed, so if you have a tin can knits pattern that you're already working on, like a love note or a strange brew or even some mitts, what's up mitts, or a baby sweater or a flax cardigan, all those things are good. Um, and we're just gonna knit together. I am hoping to put together a couple of Zoom meetups um, so that we can say hello in person or virtually, I guess, in real time, just to see, see what everybody's up to and what you guys decided to choose. There is a hashtag, which is knit us together 2022 Cal. So if you are over on Instagram, please feel free to follow me and tag, use the hashtag when you post so that I can follow along and see what you guys are making because we have such talented people in this group. I, I love it. It's really inspiring to see what everyone's up to. So that's the Tin Can Knits Knit Along. I'm hoping next week to choose a pattern and go to the yarn store and get some yarn for it so that I'm ready to cast on on the 20th. Um, and hopefully I can bring you guys along with me if I can get over my intense fear of recording in public. <laughs> um, it's a little bit better in the yarn store because like I know those ladies and they're super nice and um, they're used to it because they, they have a lot of podcasters but hopefully I can bring you along with me as I choose colors. I'd like to cast on some kind of sweater or hat or hat and a sweater or something. So to be continued I'll show you what I'm thinking about next week and Oh, one more thing. Okay, so I was poking around the internet, as you do, and I found a sweater. It's actually a t-shirt that I don't know. You probably have already heard of it because most things that I find, people are like, oh, really? The ranunculus? Yeah, Karen, that's a huge deal. Everyone, um, everyone has made that. And I'm like, oh, sorry, I just found it. Um, so I found a pattern that I really like. It is not the ranunculus. I was looking on Instagram and I found a pattern that I just, I've become semi obsessed with. <laughs> and it is the ombre t-shirt by Lark Badger. I don't know if I'm pronouncing their name correctly. Um, she is Danish, I believe. Yet more evidence that I should take up Danish so that we can hang out and be besties. Uh, but she's a knitwear designer in Denmark. So the only pattern of hers that I had been familiar with previously was called Alone Together and it was released during 2020. Hang on, I think. Yeah, it was March of 2020. So it was like right when the pandemic hit, she released this pattern called Alone Together, which was a pullover, kind of a unisex oversized uh, pullover that um, she used scraps for, I believe, which 
it, it's really a cool silhouette and a really interesting style. And so I had heard of her, but the ombre t-shirt, you guys, is where it's at. And I'm definitely knitting one, but here's the problem. The pattern currently only exists in a book of hers that's published in Danish. <laughs> it's called Strick. And yes, I have contemplated buying this book and just seeing if I can decipher the pattern, like maybe there's a chart or numbers or something. So her book Strick is being translated into English and it's gonna be called Close Knit and this pattern is in it along with a bunch of others. So that is definitely on my list of things that I'd like to pick up in late summer and I will be knitting one of these for sure for the fall. I looking at the pictures it looks like worsted weight to me um and a whole bunch of scraps which i have zero worsted weight scraps i believe zero i had a few but i used them up in that hat that color work hat that i just made up um so i'm gonna have to oh no <laughs> i'm gonna have to collect some worsted weight scraps and watch i'll collect worsted weight scraps and then it'll end up being bulky or something but in any case um, the ombre tea is super cool. If you speak Danish and you'd be willing to on the fly translate it for me, um, I would love that. I would love that. And that's all I got. I don't really have anything else going on. So I have been watching a lot of podcasts and I wanted to bring your attention to two of them because they're kind of in my regular rotation. And I consider them, um, my internet friends. So the first one is Kendra over at Balance Skein. She's in Chicago or the Chicagoland area, and she does an amazing roundup of knitting and crochet projects that she works on every month. She just released a sort of more detailed view of a single cabled sweater that is just gorgeous um, that she made. It kind of goes through from cast on to bind off, and it's amazing. And I really haven't hit, knit that many cables, and it made me think that I should get on that um, ASAP because her sweater is to die for. And then my second podcast recommendation is Mouse's Makes, which is Amanda who's over in the UK and she just hit 500 subscribers. So if you want to pop on over and see what she is up to, she makes all sorts of things like t-shirts and socks and, um, blankets and just all sorts of wonderfuls. And she is a lovely human being all around. So, um, definitely pop on over and see what she is making if you haven't already. So I hope you guys have a wonderful week. I know this wasn't really the most chatty of episodes, but I wanted to show you what I've been up to and hopefully we can check in again next week and maybe head to the yarn store. So keep your eyes out. I hope you're doing well. I hope your knitting treats you well and take care. Happy knitting. Sort of fast. We're going to talk a little bit fast, not too fast.